the Rutherford Centre for Reform Theology, based in the Highlands of Scotland, is currently trying to help people to think biblically and theologically about the church. As part of this, we're holding a series of interview discussions, which will go up on our website and Facebook page. My name is Andrew McGowan, the director of RCRT, and I will be meeting with various church leaders to discuss different aspects of the nature and function of the church. My discussion partner today is Archbishop Peter Jensen. He served as principal of Moore Theological College in Sydney, Australia, then as Anglican Archbishop of Sydney and Metropolitan of the province of New South Wales. He was also the first General Secretary of the Global Anglican Future Conference. GAFCON. Last year, Peter and I were in Jakarta, Indonesia, for the General Assembly of the World Reformed Fellowship. At that assembly, Dr. Pierre Bertou from Aix-en-Provence and I were asked to lead a seminar on the state of Christianity in Europe. In the course of that seminar, I spoke about the disunity of the church as one of the problems that we face. In the course of that seminar, at which Peter was in attendance, I spoke very strongly about that. Um, Peter has suggested that I sum up briefly what I said in order to set the context for our discussion. So, so here are three things that I said. First of all, I am convinced that the weakness of Christianity in Europe and throughout the world is directly tied to our lack of a coherent doctrine of the church and our staggering divisions. It might well be argued that at the Reformation, we regained a doctrine of justification by faith, but lost any doctrine of the church. Second, the individualism, voluntarism, and sectarian mentality of many Christian churches has weakened and undermined the unity of the church, for which Christ prayed. There are around 45,000 Christian denominations in the world, as well as numerous small independent groups, sects, and congregations. Is this honoring to God? Does this fulfill the prayer of Jesus that we should be one? And then third, our disunity is scandalous, contrary to the plain teaching of Scripture, and our denominations are a curse, not a blessing. Well, after the seminar, Peter asked that we might have a conversation about what I had said, and particularly about this strong focus on unity. Unfortunately, the program for the rest of the conference did not allow us the time we needed, so we agreed to continue the discussion electronically. And today's discussion gives us an opportunity to do so and at the same time to contribute to this series of interview discussions. Peter, sorry for the long introduction. Uh, it's good to have this time together. What was it about my comments on unity that you wanted to discuss? Thank you, Andrew. And I'm going to see if I can move this into a gallery view. There, that's better, so that I can see you while talking to you much more easily. Um, uh, thank you, Andrew. And uh, first of all, thank you very much indeed for making this opportunity. It's a wonderful thing to be asked to do. 
And secondly, thank you very much indeed for the uh, talk you gave, which was thought provoking, I have to say. And, uh, and as, you, as you can see, we are following it up and so we should. Uh, I don't disagree with you that the doctrine of the church really requires a great deal of thought and work and it's something that we should be doing. So I'm totally on board with that. And also uh, in, in deep worry about the state of things in, in, uh, in uh, Europe, uh, and in the rest of the Western world, but particularly in Europe, and uh, are very interested indeed to hear of any suggestions as to partly why this may be the case and what could be done about it. So it's, it's a very important topic, both theologically and also uh, missionally, and I'm grateful to you for the opportunity of uh, taking part in this. Uh, could I ask you, uh, Andrew, just for, I, I just wanted to ask you some questions to get some clarity, really. So I may begin by asking you some questions, if you don't mind. Um, because I've, I've always sort of drawn a distinction between denominations and churches. Uh, we call our church in Australia the Australian, uh, the Anglican Church of Australia, but it, it seems to me to be a misnomer. I don't think of it as a church as such. And I'm just wondering, uh, do you see a denomination as church or as Part of the church, or how, how do you read denomination? Well, I don't believe that there should be such a thing as denominations. Um, in the scriptures, the church was defined geographically rather than theologically or in terms of particular distinctives. So the church at Jerusalem, the church at Corinth, whatever. And I, and I think that our penchant for dividing into separate groups based on a few distinctives is deeply unhealthy. Okay, so uh, thank you. That's, that's a clarifying answer. In other words, you don't think denominations are churches? I think that denominations function as part of the church worldwide. Um, but I think that they ought not to function in that way. When the Scottish Reformation took place, um, the Church of Scotland was established, and it was established to be the religious voice of the people of Scotland in its new reformed condition. Um, but the early reformers did not regard the Church of Scotland as a denomination. They regarded the Church of Scotland as the national expression of the religious life of the people of Scotland. Um, the idea that there would be multiple uh, denominations was something that would not have occurred to them, and I think probably nor should it. Mm, that's interesting. So does that mean if... Um if there is a, 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 a break in the church and a new denomination is set up, uh, then that is something that is, that is absolutely wrong and alien. And if so, whose side would you be on in such circumstances? I, I think that uh, the, the scriptures show us the nature of the church, but they also teach us the nature of truth. And I think that there are certain issues which clearly would divide us from other people professing to be Christians. Now, a lot of the discussion will center around what those issues are. Um, so, for example, um, the Church of Scotland, of which I'm a minister, um, several years ago permitted someone in a same-sex relationship to be inducted to a charge. Now, I took the view and take the view that that leaves the church in moral error and that that should not have happened. But I do not believe that it was an issue of sufficient substance to decide that the church was no longer the church or that I should no longer 
be a minister of it. Many of my friends, as you probably know, disagreed with that decision, but that was my decision. But if, however, the church questioned the uniqueness of Christ or the doctrine of the Trinity or matters which are creedal rather than confessional or moral, I don't think I would have any choice but to leave. No, I understand that. If you, may I ask, and this is a distinct uh, situation in my own denomination, um, if you were, to, for example, to attend an assembly and there were a, a, a couple of a, a clergymen uh, who lived in a marriage relationship with someone of the same sex, uh, a thoroughly accredited member of your denomination, and uh, the Lord's Supper was held, would you be able to, may I ask, uh, by the way, these are real questions, not, <laughs> I'm not interrogating you, I'm just you know, puzzled and interesting to know. Uh, would you be able to take the Lord's Supper, given that there were persons there with whom you so significantly disagree? Yes, I would. Um, I think that probably every time in my life when I have taken the Lord's Supper, there would have been at least one person in that congregation or gathering who perhaps was in a, a position where that person should not have been in attendance at the Lord's Supper. Um, so I, I would find it very difficult to go into a, a, a judgmental situation of that kind. In Scotland, in the past, uh, you could only attend the Lord's Supper if you received the token from the elders. Yes, yes, famous, yes. But, but, but my own view is that, particularly in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, let a man examine himself before coming to the table. So it's not my primary duty to decide if other people are fit to come. My big problem is with my own sin and whether I am ready to come to the table. Mm -hmm. this, the difference one may argue this is very relevant to our situation in the Anglican communion so i'm interested in your views but uh, the difference in our situation in the situation could you say that it was that yes of course there are sinners in every group people who have hidden sins and not so hidden sins who may turn who, who may receive communion but this is an institutional problem that is to say it's not just a person who happens to be living in a same-sex relationship uh, but rather it is an institutionally approved same-sex relationship by a minister of the church. Uh, that, that doesn't make a difference? You would still receive communion? I, I think I would still receive communion, but I, I do take the point you're making about institutional issues. And mm. I, the, if you choose to remain within a church which makes these what I believe to be moral errors, then it's important that you act in order to speak out against that. Um, yes. So, for example, in 2011, the Church of Scotland General Assembly set up a theological commission to look at the issues relating to what had happened and the ordination and uh, the induction of a man in a same-sex relationship. And I served on that commission, and there were three of us who were committed to the authority of Scripture, and we produced our report. And there were three who took a different view on this matter, and they produced their report, and both were submitted as part of one paper to the General Assembly. Uh, and I and others have formed Covenant Fellowship Scotland to try and take a stand, and we've spoken up in presbyteries and assemblies. So I, I do think there is a responsibility upon us if we remain within a church that we believe um, to have committed some serious theological or moral error to speak out and not just to oh, yeah. go along yes. with it. Yes. In, in yes. your own situation, in the Anglican Church, uh, Peter, uh, has 
uh, your uh, Anglican uh, church in uh, Australia separated uh, from itself in that sense over this issue? Or, or is no, it, it hasn't, because the issue hasn't one. arisen. No, no, we, the issue has not yet arisen in that way. But in New Zealand, it has. And the, um, and the New Zealand church is fairly heavily uh, centralised in a way that the Australian church isn't. And so their general assembly, their general synod, uh, has allowed for same-sex marriage. And a, and a group of Anglican churches there withdrew from their denomination and have set up the, uh, uh, another Anglican church in New Zealand, uh, supported by the uh, uh, GAFCON movement. Uh, and I went over and was part of the consecration of a new bishop there because the church had embraced uh, a, a, a moral um, code, which is different from what I believe is in the New Testament uh, on a major issue. And I didn't think it was possible for them to retain, remain any longer. Um, if it, uh, it, Australia is a different case. But the same thing has happened in Canada and the United States of America. Peter, you, you mentioned GAFCON there, and I mentioned it in the introduction. For those who are listening yes. who don't know uh, about GAFCON, tell us what, a, what it is and how it relates to world Anglicanism. Eight other churches felt they could not any longer remain part of the Anglican church in, in Canada. And they withdrew, there have been court cases, they have lost their buildings, uh, but they have retained the Orthodox faith, which they would always believe. Now, that's an illustration of the sort of things that happened in the next few years, particularly in America, in the United States, in the, uh, the Episcopal Church there, which was the Anglican Church in North America, and uh, in the uh, United States, I should say, and uh, as they moved, they, they, they consecrated a bishop who was in active sexual relationship with, a, with another man. As they moved in that direction, so about 100,000 of their members decided they could not stay any longer over this major moral problem. And so they decided to leave, but they had nowhere to go in a sense. Um, a conference was held in 2008 called the Global Anglican Conference. Uh, and in that conference, uh, a, a confession of faith, if you like, was signed off called the Jerusalem Declaration. Uh, there were about a thousand people there, uh, clergy, bishops, lay people. And out of that emerged this movement. The conference became a movement called GAFCON. And the GAFCON movement exists. It hasn't left the Anglican Church. It's not schismatic. It hasn't left the Anglican Church. I always think it, it's... Anglican Church, because what it did was to take up David Short in St. John Shaughnessy, but the other 100,000 uh, people from North America who left their original church, and it's recognised them as truly Anglican churches. Uh, so uh, in doing that, it has sent a message to the, to the uh, liberal churches that do allow these things, that they're no longer in fellowship with them. So it's... it's, it's I think it's a movement for unity rather than division uh, because we have managed to hold within Anglicanism the people who would, could no longer stay in their original denominational boundaries. Now, that poses a huge amount of questions, and I don't know what Andrew would say to all that. Uh, but but yeah, and we've done the same thing in New Zealand quite recently. It's interesting that you should say that it focuses towards unity, because I noticed that Charles Raven, uh, the GAFCON membership development secretary, in an article on the GAFCON website, has described it as an instrument for unity. Where yes. uh, I've seen uh, some Anglicans, perhaps particularly in England, uh, who have described it as schismatic. Yes. Well, that's a very funny thing. We're, none of us has left the Anglican Church. Uh, we all still regard ourselves as part of the Anglican Communion. We haven't left it. Um, some people have, but then the ones that have, we've scooped up and retained in our fellowship. Now, of course, there's differences of opinion, 
and the Archbishop of Canterbury, who, by the way, is not the Pope, uh, but the Archbishop of Canterbury, with his uh, authority and his position, uh, hasn't been altogether um, uh, accepting of this. But then the Archbishop of Canterbury is not the Pope. So I say, no, we have, we have retained as Anglican many people who felt for reasons of conscience that they could not stay uh, within their original denomination. Now, you may disagree with that, Andrew. Your own way of doing things may be different, but it is uh, the, the very people who are doing this are people that would uh, accept the authority of Scripture and other things that mostly you agree with, I'm sure. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm vice chairman of the World Reform Fellowship, and yes. we yeah. were represented at the Jerusalem conference by Dr. You Sam. were indeed. And afterwards, he sent us all the Jerusalem statement to read. And uh, I found yeah. it encouraging and very biblical and, and theological. It is. It is. It is indeed. So it's a question, and, and it, it raises the denominational. To my, to my mind, a denomination is not a church. It's a, it's, a, it's a network of churches. And to my mind, our emphasis should be on the local church. And that's, that's why I was interested in your presentation because it challenged me somewhat about my own beliefs, uh, which are rather, let me put it this way. I think when the Lord prayed that prayer that they may all be one, I think his prayer was answered. Uh, we are all one. Uh, well, let, let's turn to that very question because <laughs> okay. in the prayer in John 17, he not only prayed that the disciples would be one, but that their oneness would reflect the oneness of the Trinity, that they may be one as we are one. Now, from what you're saying, I suspect you feel that that was not referring to an organizational unity, but more of a spiritual unity, or is it something else? Uh, well, I prefer to say, and, and here I'm, uh, I'm very interested in your views. This is an interesting and helpful discussion for me. Uh, I prefer to say it was an eschatological unity. That is to say, uh, are we one? Yes. Uh, how many churches are there? Well, there's only one church. Uh, for whom did Christ die? He died for his church. Um, uh, are we uh, all one in Christ Jesus? Galatians 3.28. Uh, is the truth. It's not, uh, it's not uh, only a hope. It's not a wish. It's the truth. Uh, we're all one in Christ Jesus. Um, and uh, all true Christians who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're not talking about nominal Christians. You're not talking about them, the real Christians. We all share the same Holy Spirit. Uh, and we are all, we are all in church now. That is to say, the eschatology of the New Testament, as you know better than I do, uh, means that we are the children of God and we will be the children of God. We do have eternal life and we will have eternal life. Uh, in other words, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places now and therefore we are with him, assembled with him now. So that's why I think uh, the prayer of Jesus is a three-part prayer in that John 17. I'll stop talking in a minute to hear your views. But in John 17, there's a three-part prayer, and each of the parts is answered. I, I don't think you could... Well, I hope you would. I've always thought it rather odd to think that the prayer of Jesus, John 17, that they may all be one, was one, not answered, and two, turned into a command. It's not a command, it's a prayer, and so forth and so on. They're, they're my thoughts. Yes, uh, and much Please of offer your corrections. I, much of that I could identify with, of course, but it does seem to me that, um, for example, I could take you to small villages in Scotland with five Presbyterian churches, where if you took all five of them together, they would easily fit into uh, one or more of the buildings available, and yet we're tying up sometimes three or four ministers in that one village when there are areas of the country with no evangelical biblical ministry. 
um, which is why I think that's scandalous. Uh, and I do believe that our disunity uh, is something we have to address. I appreciate what you say that eschatologically um, we are one, um, but I think that I don't want to use the expression that's a bit of a cop out, but it does seem to avoid the problems uh, and particularly in some places where people treat choosing a church the way they would choose a supermarket, you know, what is it that I like and don't like? Uh, do I like the music? Do I not like the music? Do I like the preacher? Do I not like the preacher? Um, and so the whole business of uh, finding a group of Christians, which is exactly to my personal liking, rather than to be part of the local church made up of all the Christians in that area who may be very different from me, and I may be different from them, but nevertheless we are together the people of God in that geographical location. So I, I think that disunity is a serious problem that we really do need to address. Well, uh, what you say is very attractive. We have a country town here in New South Wales, uh, which has got a Scottish name, and there are eight different churches in a town of 2,000. And <laughs> I think, I won't say which town it is, uh, but I'm not sure. I think two of them are Presbyterian churches, the rest are otherwise. And of course, the picture you present there is one that uh, is scandalous, maybe too strong a word, but it's unfortunate. And it's, a, it's not a good use of resources or something like that, but it may be. It, it, it depends on the circumstance. Uh, I don't think it's a theological problem. I think it, you could call it a missiological problem. Um, but I am not troubled by that particularly. I don't see it as a deep offence to the gospel. Um, unless the people are angry with each other and nasty of it. Now, let me say I'm sympathetic because one of the one of the features of Australia has been the way in which we were settled by the English, but much more by the Irish. And you can imagine that that really represents Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, broadly speaking. And one of the tragedies of this country has been the way in which uh, the ordinary person just feels in the end as though you know, we don't want any more of the squabbling between the Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican and Protestant churches. And it has, I think, had bad missiological consequences. On the other hand, um, in my view, I don't think I want to be a Roman Catholic. I know you're not suggesting that. But I certainly, what I tried to do as Archbishop, and I think this is, this is happening, is to always appear as uh, close to even my Roman Catholic friends and my Greek Orthodox friends as I possibly could. Uh, we would meet together, the, uh, the chief archbishop here and I would meet together three or four times a year and pray together. Um, I couldn't attend mass, I wouldn't attend mass. Uh, and he wouldn't take communion in my church, but I attended his church when he asked me to and so forth and so on. And we, we did things together. Uh, now, that, I think, was a useful strategy to adopt and a good thing to do. But I'm not sure I saw the need to for the two churches to amalgamate. I, I think the whole question of ecumenism is a difficult one and has been particularly for evangelicals. Um, many yeah. Christians have said that we must put truth before unity and have been deeply suspicious of any kind of ecumenical movement. And I, I can understand some of those concerns, but it seems to me that I, I must do everything I can to work towards unity with all Christians. However, we might disagree on some matters that there has to be a, a process working towards ecumenism and unity. Now, it has to be real. I mean, part of the problem with the ecumenical movement, as I see it, is that mm. it's regularly produced statements which everyone can agree with, 
but they all mean different things when they say it together. <laughs> that, that, that it's only a verbal unity, it's not a yes. real unity. Yes. So I think that evangelicals may be those who can lead that kind of serious ecumenical dialogue where we don't do that kind of looking for the lowest common denominator or a form of words, but genuinely say, what are the matters that divide us? And how can we look at these today in the light of scripture? Well, that indeed may be a way forward. If I've understood you correctly, let me just repeat back what I think we're, we're saying here. I have deep <laughs> suspicion of the ecumenical movement in any case. Uh, one of the problems with it, I'll come back to the other point you've made in a moment, but one of the problems with it, interestingly, is I think it has consumed an immense amount of effort in the 20th century. Um, and it's interesting that, however, that when the ordination of women came along, the very people who were all enthusiastic for ecumenicism, I'm not talking about persons like yourself, but more liberal Christians, for them it was almost the gospel. Then when the ordination of women came along, suddenly they embraced that idea, even though it was highly divisive. And it means that in our church, in the Anglican Church in Australia, we now have uh, clergy who cannot operate across the boundaries because uh, they are not recognised as clergy. So it was interesting to me that the ecumenical movement, it seemed to me, ran out of steam and other more interesting things came along, which actually, and the sexuality thing is a, is it a greater case in point. The very people who made a big fuss about ecumenicism, I'm not talking about you, brother, but but others have decided that uh, evangelicals don't matter. They can do without us. Uh, it's more important to please the world, if I may put it like that. Now, uh, come back to your other point, though, which interests me uh, particularly, and that is the evangelical. If you think of the uh, if you think of the worldwide Christianity as divided into four categories, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but you know the the, the Bible alone, and then the Bible plus reason, or pl Bible with reason, uh, and then the Bible plus tradition, and the Bible plus experience. Think of those four categories. Uh, the evangelical category, Bible alone, is a pretty big category, and it's wonderful. My experience is that evangelicals of whatever denomination have been some of the most, you know, inspiring and helpful people to me and our unity is real. I'm sure you've had, I mean, here we are, Andrew, you are a Presbyterian. Here am I, Peter. I'm a terrible Anglican. But, you know, brother, we talk, we have Fellowship of the World Reform Fellowship. Um, that is... So it, I'm an evangelical first and an Anglican second. Yes, I, I, I um, was greatly influenced in my early Christian walk by both Scripture Union and yes, yes. The, the, the Christian Union in the university. And uh, we were influenced by people like uh, Howard Marshall, who was one of my teachers. And yes, Jeffrey Grogan and others. And so I suppose I would agree with you that it's Christian first and uh, Presbyterian second. I'm not, no, I said evangelical first. Well, I think Christian first. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I hope that, that that's reasonable because... Um, uh, I think that I am first and foremost a Christian, saved by grace through faith because of what Jesus did on the cross before I ever think about what my theological views are. So I think that has to come first for me. I've got a bit of a problem with your categories. Uh, I, I agree in principle, but for example, uh, an evangelical is Bible only, and then others with Bible and tradition. My experience of evangelicals is that they are sometimes more bound by tradition uh, than some Roman Catholics I know. Um, particularly, um, I don't want to spell out uh, any particular uh, 
group or whatever. But sometimes in parts of North America, the commitment to the Westminster Confession of Faith, which I also affirm, is such that it's almost on a par with Scripture. Um, and I think that no confessional statement can ever be put on a par with Scripture. Now, most people don't do that, but some do. So I think that there are evangelicals for whom tradition is much stronger than perhaps we might uh, think it should be. That's a, a very true observation. And of course, when I say scripture alone, I do mean that tradition comes into this and reason and experience, but it's, it's uh, the question of how they fit together. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you I do think mean, we have but, to say no. that, that the authority of God speaking by his Holy Spirit in and through the scriptures is the final authority in all matters. Amen. That's more or less what you said in your book on scripture, I think. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Um, can I ask you a question? Though? Sorry. In, in your hypothetical, but probably real, Highland village with uh, 2,000 people and, uh, or a smaller, but eight churches, where is the body of Christ in this? Do they all go to make up the body of Christ? Are they all part of the body of Christ? Are they? All, how would you use that metaphor of yeah. the churches there? Obviously, the scriptures contain many different metaphors in relation to the church, um, mm. which the body of Christ is a significant one. When I think about the body of Christ, I think of all those who have been baptized by God's Spirit into uh, the body of Christ, uh, using Paul's language in, in First yeah. Corinthians. And so the body of Christ is made up of every believer. Um, I, I, yes. What I found interesting, though, as you may know, it's not just the Rutherford Center for Reformed Theology that's discussing ecclesiology just now. I'm also in a different uh, context leading the Theological Commission of WRF in a discussion on ecclesiology. Yes. But part of our early discussion, I, I noted that in the chapter on the church in the Westminster Confession of Faith, the, yes. first, the first section is on the invisible church. Yes. And the second section is on the visible church. Yes. It's interesting that it's in that second section on the visible church that it says outside the church there is ordinarily no possibility of salvation. Now, today it's mostly Roman Catholics who use that language, which came from the early church father Cyprian. But it's interesting that the Westminster divines were applying that to the visible church. And, and I think that perhaps they had a much higher picture of the visible church than we have. I think for many younger people today, particularly, the church appears to be almost an optional extra. Yes, which is, as you and I would totally agree, not possible, not for a Christian. And uh, I often quote Cyprian's words myself, as did John Calvin, as you well know. Uh, doesn't the Westminster Confession, however, call the church the kingdom of God, or am I wrong? It uses the language of the kingdom of God. Um, personally, I think that that language is probably overstated in relation to the visible church. Yes, I think it is too. It's, it's, uh, it, it is one of those area, areas in which I would have to dissent from, I think I'm right in saying I'd have to dissent from the I, I wonder whether, however, let me come back to the eschatological. I wonder whether rethinking the doctrine of the church, it would be really important. I'm sure uh, the World Reform Fellowship would be doing this. 
really think it through from an eschatological point of view. In Hebrews 12, uh, we, are, we are already in the assembly of the firstborn, uh, for example. Um, and uh, I, I have in mind 1 Corinthians 12, where he's talking to the Corinthians. You are the body of Christ, he says. You're not, he doesn't say you're part of the body. He says you, not that you said that, but uh, there are people who say that sort of thing. You know, you're part of the body of Christ. But I take it that each local church is a manifestation of the one true church of Jesus Christ, that it ought to attend to its unity. And I really believe in the unity of the church, preeminently the local church. And Ephesians 4 comes into that. But that the, uh, the church is in itself the body of Christ. And I think that's what I would call an eschatological approach to this whole subject. Uh, which will give us, I think, a fresh way of looking at things, which will be very helpful. Um, it will, in the end, make denominations what they really are, just matters of convenience, really. Um, uh, institutional networking. Uh, it will certainly commit us, as the Apostle Peter does. He talks about the brotherhood spread throughout the world. It's, it's not as though we are leaving behind the idea of a worldwide movement, that, that would be unbiblical. Uh, but we're not seeing it necessarily. We're focusing on the fellowship of the local church, which after all is where most believers ever experience church. I've gone on too long, Andrew. <laughs> Come no, back, no. take up one of those 50 no, no, I, I think I, I agree very much with what you say about the local church, particularly if it's defined geographically and not in terms of distinctives um, and, and I see the importance of looking at the body of Christ uh, in that eschatological way I'm, I'm fine with that. Our time is, is coming towards the end so let me come to one final uh, question although I think you've probably asked more questions than I have to be fair <laughs> but my last question would be John's Gospel chapter 13 and 35 Jesus said by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another how can we demonstrate that love in a divided and disunited church especially where individual congregations and denominations uh, and national churches are often at loggerheads with each other uh, well, dear brother, to my mind, eight churches in a village is neither here nor there. It doesn't worry me particularly. But what does worry me if we see two things. First of all, that the local congregation within those churches uh, is toxic, fighting, uh, dominated by bullies, etc., etc., etc. This is so wrong. It is so antithetical to the unity of the church, which is a gift in the first place. It's the gift of the unity and the Lord has prayed for it. We have received it. Now we are to act it out. And uh, when we see local churches, the, the horror of local churches fighting amongst themselves and the scandal that is in the neighborhood is what because most people come across the church in their location. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that it would be tragic if amongst the eight churches there, there was not a deep respect amongst the leadership of the churches and the membership of the church, uh, particularly as uh, if it's true to say we all belong to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and the danger of making um, infant baptism into a shibboleth by which we judge each other. And, uh, and uh, now, in a sense, according to my argument, if we're going to have people who believe in infant baptism and people who don't, and they choose to have different congregations, I'm frankly not too well worried about it. But if those congregations are at each other's throats about this, then I believe that's uh, contrary to God's word and brings scandal to the truth of the gospel and is, is tragic and needs to be dealt with. So that's how I view it. You and I don't necessarily agree on this, uh, but uh, we do agree on an awful lot. I think we agree on most things, Peter. Um, I believe we do. 
that that verse that I read there from John 13, as I see it, the main emphasis that Jesus is, is making is the witness to those outside the church. Yes. We've spoken a bit about how individual congregations should relate to one another. But I, when I was principal of the Highland Theological College, we would occasionally have overseas visitors. And uh, I knew that inevitably the question would come round. They would say, look, we were walking around the town and, and we saw the, the Church of Scotland and we saw a free Church of Scotland and we saw a sign for an associated Presbyterian churches. And before long, I, I realized that if only they knew how many others there were as well. And, and I, found it, I found it almost embarrassing uh, to try and explain something of our divided Scottish church history. You uh, are a little bit famous for this, Andrew, I have to say, in fairness. There's a great moment in a novel, a Canadian novel, about the uh, Presbyterian churches and the way in which this particular one broke away from the other over the question of whether the word e eternal, in the word eternal damnation, represented a long enough period. So, <laughs> the sunshine sketches of a little town, I think that's where it can be found. Yes, but it, it does, crazies, take doctrine very seriously, and I honour you for that. In our, in, in our defense, I should say that some of my friends in the Netherlands told me the history of their uh, churches oh. and dividing, yes. and it, it's it's almost as bad as that. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's, it's, it's been a great pleasure. You take doctrine very seriously. That's good. And that's good. Peter, it's been a great privilege to have this uh, time together. And I hope that it will perhaps prompt uh, others to discuss these matters. And uh, perhaps at a future date, we might come back to discuss other things. But I want I'd to, love to thank you much for today. And thank you for participating uh, in this recording. Thank you very much. Not at all. It's great to be here.